But I think part of the problem with the definition of AGI is it benchmarks AI, artificial intelligence, to biological intelligence or the human intelligence. But I think the world is changing, and rather than just having a small number of people write code for everyone, if we can let everyone learn just a little bit of code, everyone has to have an understanding of this technology in order to know how to incorporate it into your own lives, how to use it to help your families, how to teach it to our kids, how to use it to build our businesses. I want you to know that I believe in Thailand. I think Thailand has the potential to do a lot of work in AI. If there's going to be a possible, you know, implications to the SMB, um, will this widen the gap further between, you know, the the SMB and the large conglomerates as well as startups? Um, and how do we not, you know, leave them behind? AGI um, stands for Artificial General Intelligence, and I think the most common definition of AGI is AI that can do any intellectual tasks that a human can. So um, if or when we achieve AGI, a person can learn to drive a car, fly an airplane, a person can learn to write a PhD thesis. So I think when with AGI, we should have AI able to learn to drive a car as well as you can, learn to fly an airplane, maybe learn to write a PhD thesis. So I think that's very difficult. I think we're still many decades away from reaching AGI. Um, but I hope we'll get there in our lifetime. Maybe we will. And, you know, maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't. It turns out that there are a few um, people that have been using a non-standard definition of AGI. Um, for example, one definition that you know some some people are floating is AI that could do a lot of economically useful work, um, which is a non-standard definition of AGI. And I think one of the reasons different people have such different views on when we get to AGI is these alternative definitions. I was chatting with a friend uh, that's an economist uh, a couple months ago, and he said to me, "Hey, Andrew." If the definition of AGI is AI that could do, you know, 50% of economic work, then maybe 200 years ago, most of humanity was working in agriculture, and in the United States and in some countries, a lot more than 50% of agriculture has been automated. Right, the United States went from over 90% of the population working in agriculture to now, I'm not sure, it's maybe like one or two percent. So vast majority of agriculture has been automated. So by that definition of AGI, we actually achieved AGI 30 years ago. Right? And so depending on how you define AGI, maybe we had AGI 30 years ago, which I don't think is a good definition, or I think for the more standard definition, I think we're still many, many decades away. But I think part of the problem with the definition of AGI is it benchmarks AI artificial intelligence to biological intelligence or the human intelligence. And it turns out that AI is already smarter than any of us in specific narrow tasks. It's just that, but if you force AI to do everything that a human can do, because biological intelligence and artificial intelligence are so different, if you force AI to be benchmarked against the biological intelligence path, that's just really difficult for AI to do. So as useful as AI is today, and as fast as AI is becoming even more useful, if you make it do everything biological intelligence could do, that, that is a maybe almost slightly unnatural, well, it's a very difficult comparison, which is why I think we're still many decades away, maybe even longer, um, if you want AI to do every intellectual task that a human needs. So the religious leaders read the Holy Book to you. So just sit in the audience, you don't need to read. Uh, just go and listen to the, to, to the religious leaders read to you. Fortunately, we figured out that if we try to teach everyone literacy, then people can communicate much better with each other and society is much richer. At this moment, I feel like we're still in that era where some people think, you don't need to learn to code. Let's just let the high priests and priestesses attack. 
that is the employees of the big tech companies. Let's let them write all the code and we just use their codes. But I think the world is changing. And rather than just having a small number of people write code for everyone, if we can let everyone learn just a little bit of coding, then all of us, everyone will be able to use computers in a much deeper way and everyone will be much richer for it. Which is why I think we should, starting with our children, let's teach all of our kids just a little bit of coding. Um, and then I think adult professionals as well. I know we're all busy, you know, we have things to do, uh, but I'm seeing a lot of adult professionals that are not in software engineering jobs, learn just a little bit of coding and that makes them much more effective at their work as well. However, um, there's another important stakeholders in Thailand that I would like to raise question for, um, the SMB, small and medium-sized businesses, uh, which makes up a, a huge portion of the Thai business landscape. Uh, I wonder if you foresee if it's a if there's going to be a possible, you know, implications to the SMB, um, will this widen the gap further between, you know, the, the SMB and the large conglomerates as well as startups? Um, and how do we not, you know, leave them behind? Yeah, so I know that, um, well, I'll say something with you off the K-Bank perspective, since I know uh, uh, we met of a, uh, k -Bank CEO uh, Kun Katia yesterday, who talked a lot about the desire of k -Bank to hold SMPs. Uh, but I share my perspective. So I feel like um, does technology tend to concentrate wealth and power, or does it tend to distribute and lift everything up? Um, and I think technology actually does a bit of both. When technology is developed initially, um, it does tend to be in the hands of a smaller number of people and there is a concentrating effect. But there's one other force that I think tends to make things fairer, which is education and training and tools. So for example, um, when smartphones and web search became widely accessible, that made individuals more powerful and individuals, including um, SMBs, could do more. And I think we're going through a critical transition period of generative AI, where right now, there is a concentration of knowledge, say, in Silicon Valley and a few places like that and a few companies. But I think with education and training, as well as widespread av availability of tools, uh, such as you know anyone can now go online and access ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini or other tools, that has a democratizing effect to the technology, um, which is why even though we should keep inventing technology, which makes people more powerful. I think we have to keep on working to build tools to make it available to everyone. Um, and then I know K-Bank has been very committed to that as well. So I think like yesterday, like um, Andrew mentioned, like um, we brought like um, Kun Andrew to, um, to meet with um, Kun Katia. And uh, we also mentioned about like, um, you know, how we can use um, AI and building application and tools to help like um, SMBs in Thailand. That's the one, that's one of the agenda that we are committed to do, you know, like um, for example, something that is as easy as, you know, like um, we are creating like um, many AI tools to help on the finance of SMB, you know, like, um, and also the other thing like, um, you know, like um, to help them. I th and I think like, um, like uh, what I like, what Andrew said on the, um, you know, like um, some like um, on the tools and education is kind of like um, distributed pretty well. That's like a long tail that we can do so much. And if you look at it, you know, like in the past, it's, it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible to build like, um, you know, like um, many businesses based on online, you know, like a um, pure online alone. Many businesses was born because of TikTok. Many businesses very profitable and high, rapidly rising, you know, like um, from YouTube. And then you can create like, um, you know, like um, many new businesses that is available by smartphone, by like, um, you know, like um, YouTube, TikTok, social media, and many other things. And I think like um, this wave is not an exception. If you create a lot more, you know, like um, values for these like um, SMB and small like people, you know, like um, many small people are empowered by technology, they can do a lot more. And I think like um, actually like um, what Andrew said, you know, like um, there 
they on the stage. That's what I like. You know, like they are they are automating at the task level, but not the job level. And basically, like um, this kind of like technology. And then when you combine it with the um, previous generation technology, those who know how to use and unleash it, you know, they will just like um, jump like um, start. They know a friend, you know, like he create like a um, business like I think like a one million US dollar revenue. You know, one person one person and if you look at like um you know like um, for example like um, many many existing tools that smb use already they embed ai you know like um, even like um, something simple this morning it just got announced like a um, my robot you know like um, that we use for collaboration just had an ai you know canva you know like um, it has an ai and so it just like um you know learning how to use these tools and create like um, um a workflows and then like um you know a speed up your um, you are like um, you know like um, you and also like um, what Andrew mentioned in his speech as well is that like um, we may think of um, AI as a cost saving tools but actually like um, creating revenues as well it's a huge potential for SMB to like um, to fight against a bigger guy, a big guy you know? there are maybe two thoughts I want to share the first is when I look at AI and when I look at Thailand um, I want you to know that I believe in Thailand. I think Thailand has the potential to do a lot of work in AI. And maybe what I hope is that um, you too will believe in Thailand. The AI ecosystem, the startup ecosystem, the number of projects being done by KBTG um, and other Thai businesses, there is really something here. But I think for Thailand to reach its full potential, all of us will need to work hard and believe in the people and in this country's potential to get there. So that's the first thing that I hope you remember from this, which is uh, I believe in Thailand and I hope you do too. And then there's one other thought I want to share with you. When about 10 years ago, uh, AI started to rise really rapidly in China, one of the most important factors that not many people know about was the media in China. Um, because it turns out, AI as a general purpose technology, it affects everyone's lives, right? It, 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 certainly all knowledge workers, but also people that are not currently knowledge workers. So it affects everyone. And what that means is, both for technical people, like engineers that need to learn this technology and use it, as well as for non-technical people, people like reporters, marketers, salespeople, everyone has to have an understanding of this technology in order to know how to incorporate it into your own lives, how to use it to help your families, how to teach it to our kids, how to use it to build our businesses. And because AI is so widely applicable and so pervasive to everyone, what I saw was media, certainly in China, played a huge role in educating everyone across society about what's really going on. And what I saw with the rise of AI in China was um, because the Chinese media wrote a lot about AI, a lot of the reporters you know, spent time to learn, become a little bit more technical. That was a huge force for educating both citizens who are non-technical, as well as helping engineers in China deeply understand what's really happening in the technology. We've been brainstorming a few ideas. Um, maybe it's too early to talk about the specific ideas, but just to share some general thoughts. Um, in the case of healthcare, you know, Thailand has a very robust healthcare system, really to, to, to your credit. And I think that uh, medical tourism uh, has also been a strong part of uh, why people, part of why people come to Thailand. Um, but I'm seeing AI also have a strong impact on healthcare. Um, my team at AI Fund has been working on a startup uh, that ended up launching, a, uh, that ended up trying to build a medical product for India because we felt that um, with US regulations being very complex and hard to navigate, there's certain healthcare products to help patients that will be easier to go to markets outside the United States. Uh, in, in India, is one attempt where they were working with entrepreneurs in particular. But I think um, I find that it's often the industries where you're already strong, those are the opportunities that become even stronger. And so I think AI for healthcare uh, uh, would be one exciting thing to, to build here. And then I think also tourism, I don't know, over the last couple of days, we're chatting a bunch of different ideas. 
uh, whether AI can help grow tourism or help tourism to already in the country. Um, have a few ideas, but probably, probably too too early to say exactly what we'll do. But I think that uh, I, I I think you you could probably imagine some of the applications where where it's, it's still exploring, right? But I'm excited about exploring these applications. Mm -hmm.